So for this final week, we're going to do physics engines and talk about some of the plugins that are available um, for Grasshopper. Uh, a little like the uh, App Store in uh, Android or, or iOS or something, um, Grasshopper accept any developers to develop their own plugins, and there's tons of them available. Uh, foodforrhino.com is the main website to download. Uh, plugins both for Rhino and for Grasshopper and grasshopperdocs.com is a great website that just categorizes a lot of the main plugins. It doesn't have them all, um, but it sort of puts them into sections and has long lists of plugins that are available. For um, Food for Rhino, it doesn't have all the plugins, but it has most or a lot of them because people can just make their own plugin and offer it on their own private website. But. So a plugin, most plugins are going to be uh, .ghA files and we're going to download one and I'll show you how to install it. But we basically go from the top file, special folders, components, and then that opens uh, uh, the folder libraries and you just drag um, or copy paste whatever your downloaded plugin is as a .gha file into the libraries. Some plugins have their own custom installers and other ones might have this .gh user file and they go into user objects. They're sort of half-built plugins or um, not as complete ones. With all the plugins, some of the plugins are old and have not been updated and that's a problem in, in some cases. And so, if you're like looking at plugins, do check the last update date. If it's 2014, there might be some issues there, but as long as it's in the last couple of years, it's probably gonna work fine. So the categories um, Grasshopper Docs offers, you can kind of see all these uh, categories. I'm not gonna read them all, but um, things range from 3D printing and fabrication uh, plugins to solar analysis, integrating with other software, uh, origami, maths, jewelry. Uh, and they just offer a lot of extra features around um, that. I think some of the kind of core ones are, are uh, especially dealing with mesh geometry, which is not Rhino or Grasshopper's native um, geometry format. So um, there's several uh, plugins for mesh geometry, but um, there's there's quite a lot out there. Um, so these are, are some plugins. Uh, Silkworm is by Adam Holloway and Arthur Manimani, and um, it's uh, friends of mine. And it's for 3D printing. And what it does, which is quite cool, if you're gonna take geometry built in Grasshopper, 3D printers normally slice uh, your 3D model into two-dimensional uh, two dimensional slices. And that limits the kind of geometry you can design. You can't sort of do a basket design that has to go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, and not just do two dimensional slices. So Silkworm is a plugin that lets you control the G code for machines directly. And you can kind of see this example here that to do each one of these um, uh, lines inside, it's kind of going up, down, uh, continuously. So it's not printing just in two dimensional layers, one after the other. It's a relatively, I'd say, advanced plugin to know how to use. Uh, Open Nest is a plugin for um, nesting objects. So this is a uh, drawn with Shape Diver, and all of these squares are nested here on a presumably a four uh, sheet of plywood. And you can kind of set the limits of your material size and different nesting patterns and have uh, your geometry automatically update. So you kind of move your sliders, it changes your geometry and you can see how many sheets you would need to cut that and sort of optimize for a low number of sheets um, and see everything moving all in tandem. Energy analysis and simulation, uh, Ladybug and Honeybee are, are, I have not used them. I've used other software which kind of does the same thing, but not parametrically, like Ecotect, which is now owned by Autodesk. But this is for solar analysis and energy um, analysis. 
So you can draw a room with windows facing different directions and all the buildings surrounding and creates the shadows, tells you exactly how many lumens throughout the day or throughout the year it would get. And you can look at it at any time, any day, set the latitude so you know the position of the sun and see how much sh shadows will be created and how your building will affect other buildings around the neighborhood and how those other buildings will affect your building. And it's, I guess it's more architectural. Um, they plug in. Human is a plugin for um, uh, user interface stuff. The main feature I use it, and sometimes you have a plugin, you just use one or two things on it, is this is in Grasshopper, just a, a screen capture, but you can change the line weights or the colors of any of the lines. So you don't have to bake it and then do it all in Rhino. You can just do it directly in Grasshopper, moving beyond the, the red geometry and the green geometry that you're selected to sort of color it any color you want and any line weights. And, you could set different geometries, different groups of geometries, different line weights. So you could sort of layer your drawing that way. Uh, agents are um, relatively complex, I would say. Um, agents in computing are kind of little points that would react uh, amongst each other. They can collide and react to their collisions. And you sort of set the rules um, where all of, in this example, which is the video example for this uh, Zebra uh, plugin, that you would set them that they're gonna stay on this uh, surface, but they're all gonna bump into each other and this is the lines they would make. And it's it's quite complicated, but anyway, that's agents um, that you can do in Uh Galapagos is a evolutionary solver uh, plugin that comes pre-installed. And that is when you want to optimize um, sort of find all the variables to optimize anything. So this is a, a, an example, just a screen capture of a YouTube tutorial prepared by Parametric House, which is, there's their YouTube uh, channel. So it's a you know, 30, 40 minute tutorial, but it, it, it's quite um, comprehensive. And what it is, is, is the variables of this shape, in, in this example, the variables of this shape um, do all the variables to produce the lowest bounding box, the lowest volume. And it works by sort of producing uh, 10 variables or 20 vari variable options, then saying these five are the best, produce 20 variables of those five, then these five are the best, produce 20 variables of those five. And it takes as long as you want, but it sort of bit by bit, layer by layer, sort of gets closer and closer to what you um, your desired output, you sort of set the restraints, the limits, and then say optimize for, in this case, the lowest volume. So this is an example, I mentioned this in week one, where this is what humans would make and an evolutionary solver was asked to sort of use the lowest amount of material, maintain a, don't go below a, um, a, a certain sort of structural limit, basically you have to be structurally sound and produce a node that would let, uh, I think it's five holes to, to put wires through and just make it smaller, tighter, cheaper, uh, um, using maybe 3D printing or something like that. So this is uh, let run for a little while. And if you let it run forever, it, it sort of gets to, keeps going more and more and more optimized. There's a, a really cool example. I, I probably mentioned it in week one about the, um, the valves from the 60s of uh, detergent valves and the um, engineers wanted to kind of do this option where they figure out the valve and somebody just wanted to do these kind of options. And it was sort of manually done where they made 10 valves. Don't know why this works, but this one works best. Okay, make 10 variants of that valve and keep going until I think they made 400 different valves and they just said, this one works the best, no idea why. Um, no, of course they know why, but it's um, cool. Um, there's a lot of geometry plugins. Uh, NGON is one of them. And an NGON, uh, if most meshes are triangular meshes or quad meshes, uh, an NGON is a face on a mesh that is more than four sides or has more than four points. And really, they just work. Uh, I did this little diagram at the side by they are actually a triangular mesh, but they sort of ignore uh, a bunch of the triangles and just sort of you can produce different shapes in the grasshopper um, using the components in the NGON plugin to make whatever kind of shapes you want, as long as they're sort of on the grid lines of some other triangular or quad mesh. 
they can be really useful. Uh, bifocals, I have installed um, or I have put into um, most of the work I've done. Uh, it's mainly for online teaching and showing things. You see this top example, that's with bifocals off, and this is with it on, uh, and it just goes anywhere on um, in Grasshopper, and it just adds these um, names of the components so that if you were to search for them, you could use these searches and, and find the different components. Uh, this is a cool project from 2008 that I wanted to figure out how to draw and um, I kind of figured out a method to draw using uh, subdivision uh, surfaces in Rhino and then using mesh rebuilding, kind of like the ISO trim command that meshes are used to uh, control uh, geometry on surfaces and, and different ways of dividing that surfaces and Rebuilding in different types of mesh can be a nice way of changing the shape of the cells and controlling the density of the cells. Uh, and then in this case, I this is what I did. I, I didn't do it, but basically mesh from subdivision, quad remesh, so make it all sort of square meshes and um, then get the control points, delete one point because I didn't want it, and then do a NURBS curve and then brought that into Rhino and did a pipe command which gave me that. There's uh, plugins coming out all the time. And um, I just saw, I just put on Twitter, Grasshopper plugin. So this is uh, Shiba Inu, which came out last week for Japanese patterns in Grasshopper. I've not downloaded it, but I just saw it and uh, put it in here. Most of Rhino's plugins and uh, other software are all named after animals. It's not true of all the plugins, but um, and their network license is called the Zoo. If you're in a corporate office and they have 100 licenses, so you have the Zoo, Rhino, Grasshopper, Flamingo, and other softwares. So we're going to start doing um, a tensile structure in physics. Uh, Kangaroo is the name of the plugin, or Kangaroo 2. And um, this is a stadium. I, I grew up in the Middle East, and this was on my school bus route uh, every day. And drawing this geometry would be quite difficult um, to get the right curvature on it uh, using just normal drawing. So you kind of want some uh, physics going on there. And that's what we're going to start with. And probably more famous example uh, is the Munich Olympic Stadium in 1972, which had this sort of tensile uh, roof over it. And it's not limited to just uh, tent structures, but this is, uh, again, something that you would draw with the same geometry, the TWA terminal in New York City, which is now a hotel, because this terminal is actually tiny relative to the size of a modern terminal. It just sort of sits um, in front of the, the big jet blue terminal that's behind it now. It's a really cool building. If you're in uh, JFK um, and have extra time, try find it. And then the Block Research Group by uh, Philip Block is um, really cool. And this is kind of a similar geometry as what we're going to create, but he um, is, uh, I guess, an engineer and uh, has a research group in Zurich. And, and I think they were at MIT beforehand. And they're trying to do really cool stuff with uh, vaults and uh, brick. And here's a tessellation pattern of bricks from one of his projects. This is built. Calculating this to work is, is I guess, work. It's complicated. And just as another uh, tensile skin uh, project, this is the Proud of Transformer by OMA. And I was in the office when this was done. And it's sort of just these different shapes. They got a giant crane to flip this uh, at different times. So depending on whether the circle's at the bottom or this cross, it's either a fashion catwalk or a um, theater or, or other things. And then they sort of shrink wrapped it in this giant um, thing like uh, when I was moving, I did a lot of shrink wrapping. So I'm going to go into Grasshopper now and so we're going to start with a uh, kangaroo, which is pre-installed and uh, if I make this uh, bigger so I can see the full names, uh, there it is there, Kangaroo 2. 
and there's lots of stuff going on here. The probably most important part of it is the solver, which is um, the kind of end uh, part of it. The bouncy solver and solver, I'll show you the differences when we get to the end, but uh, I want that for right from the beginning. And then I'm going to make a uh, geometry to go into that. So I'm going to start with uh, or just creating a rectangle. And I want this one with the uh, orange red with the black around it. And I can do 100 on the slider for the X and the Y. And then just turn this rectangle into a surface. And I just want to get the control points of the surface, which will give me the, the corner points as points. And I want to mesh the surface because a lot of this stuff is done with meshes. I have to get the right one. It's, it's this one with the sort of orange mesh background and the white sort of twisted uh, shape on top of it. And I want to put the surface into the S. And I've got this clash over here that uh, I can turn some of this stuff off. It's, I don't need to see it. So this mesh is got U and V rather than X and Y, which is the number of cells we want to create. And I'm going to make a 100 point slider, but turn it down. And I'm going to have the same for the U and the V. And when I do a mesh, I can actually see the mesh uh, currently. Um, I could do mesh edges if I wanted to see it, which is a plugin. There is, um, so there's the mesh if I wanted to see it. Uh, I don't, but um, there is uh, one that I forget that's not part of a plugin, but it, it does the same thing. And I want to use a, a command which is uh, from Kangaroo as well. Oh, that might be it there. It's not. Um, which is naked uh, vertices, and oh, that's not the right one. Oh, that's true. So it's the one with the yellow and the blue there, and that basically turns all the mesh points or the mesh vertices into points in Rhino which are, are slightly different vertices are just on the mesh, but points can be used in sort of nerves geometry. And I have these options for clothed and uh, naked. And what that means, uh, if I put a, a point just to visualize it, that the clothed ones are the ones that aren't on the boundary and the naked ones are the ones on the boundary. I'm gonna want that for later. And with this uh, solver, um, I'm going to put a whole bunch of things in together into the goal uh, objects. I just want a button, which I can type button for the reset. Sometimes it needs to be sort of manually reset. Okay. So edge length is. So goals mesh is where we get um, our things that we're going to uh, use or different kind of forces uh, relative to meshes. And we're going to kind of like fields that it doesn't so much matter what numbers we use as long as they're all proportional to each other. So the mesh that we're going to do is the this one, which is sort of the, the mesh surface, which is written as mesh UB there. And length factor, I'm just going to do 10.00. And this is basically a command that sort of says the lines between each of these um, can stretch if it wants. And this is the uh, amount that it can stretch. 
before I go further, actually, I want to just turn. Um, so this is going to allow the mesh to stretch the edge lens command. I also want uh, vertex loads, which is from the same sort of goals mesh. And that's sort of a, a weight on every single one of these points. Um, so it wants the mesh in there. And let's just put strength above it. I'll mess with them later. I think it's going to have to be way higher, but I'll mess with them later. And then we also want anchor points. So anchor points in this case of the vault are points that are going to lock the mesh to the ground. And we're going to set a strength for the anchor points. And um, we could do the corners, which this uh, control points is the corners. So if we make the corners anchor points, that means we're locking that to the ground and it can pull off the ground depending on the strength. So this is uh, a relative number for how much strength they are pinned to the ground. And we're gonna mess with all these numbers afterwards. So at this point we have anchor points, which are the four corners, edge lengths, which are the sort of uh, lines between all these points that are how stretchy they can be. Uh, and then vertex loads pushing down or upward on each of them. Um, actually, sorry, that's going to be a vector. So unit Z. So that's pushing on the Z axis. We could do it any way we wanted. And there might want to be negative. I can't remember. And we also, um, not fully necessary, but um, the show uh, button, which is a kangaroo one. So that just uh, means our mesh is going to be shown uh, when it sort of moves through. And so we've got anchor points, we've got show, we've got edge lengths, we've got vertex loads. And we're basically going to just put all of these in here. We optionally can merge the data, um, which kind of just makes it neater before we go for the end. So all of them are our goal objects. And we see what's happening here already that we have a little bit of stretchiness. The bouncy solver, I can now explain what that means as opposed to a solver. A solver just does the final um, uh, calculation immediately, where the bouncy solver, you sort of uh, see it sort of bounce into its position, which sometimes can reveal either mistakes in it or, or be useful depending on what kind of stuff you're doing, or sometimes you want the animation as your primary goal. But, and um, we can also see that the, the, the anchor points are coming off the, the sort of corners. So this is only a strength of 12. So we can basically turn this up and lock it down uh, more. And if we really don't want it to take off the ground, we can just go for some crazy high number just for the thing. And that basically means that is uh, pinned to the ground, cannot be moved. And if we mess with how stretchy our uh, mesh is, you see it sort of get tighter there. And then this is the loads uh, pushing down, um, which can go really small. So with the sort of, um, the thing we're basically just making a whole bunch of uh, forces that um, will then go into our goal objects. And if we wanted, we could take um, 
let's say wind and uh, it would want the original mesh and it would want probably a vector a direction and the strength so uh, let's say we were to blow the wind from the y direction and i don't want this to be that big so add that into the bottom of merge it's gonna lower wind which is not really a brick arch but might be useful for something else we do and, and basically you just add forces and um plug them into goal objects and delete the wind because it's not that relevant and i guess if if you start doing that much so far and then i'll move on afterwards because um this sort of can be complicated to understand at first. Actually, I'm not going to use that till the next example. All right, so I don't know if you guys have been uh, doing it as I've been talking or waiting. Bit of both. I was. Uh, I might have been on. I don't know if my volume was on or no one was speaking. But um, anyway, I'm here now. And I turn off stuff at the beginning. And sometimes at the end here, I can just do geometry and I only want that one. So, because this has the points and all the other stuff and there's my, my final. Do so you have any questions or want to share their screen and I can help along? Yes, as usual, mine doesn't look like that. <laughs> I'll share, I'll just... Uh, this one's kind of complicated. Uh, it's close, although I have to admit, I, I missed last week, sorry, I wasn't there alive. I was working on catching up on it. And um, uh, so I... I Put on the rectangle and immediately it didn't look like yours and then i thought then i put on the square grid and it certainly didn't look like yours and i thought huh that's weird i struggled with it for about an hour then i loaded your file in and it looked the same as mine so there's something wrong with something different in my rhino settings that actually got it to be wrong and i i stopped because this class started but anyway oh um we can i, I take 30 seconds of your time we'll, now to look we'll figure it. that out later though um um, but I'll definitely help you with it and make sure we get it sort of solved. Um, I, I can't say what it is right now, but no, 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 it's okay. It's quite all right. Don't worry about it. It, it was showing a, it was showing by an eight by eight grid centered on uh, like centered at zero, so it was minus four to plus four in x and y, and I, that one just sort of blew me away. And the triangles were centered on the origin, not on the vertices of the grid. So it was like okay. But yours looked like that too, so I didn't understand. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, it's like, okay, well, I know mine's wrong, but wait, why is it look that way? <laughs> um, I mean, I'll double check the file. I mean, I, I'm not I'm sure, sure it's what not it the is. file. It's, yeah, I'm sure it's my end, so I'm not to worry. Yeah, it could be some setting. But anyway, are, are you working on this now? Oh, yeah, no, no, absolutely working on this. I'm actually just... Uh, They're not necessarily related, so not not knowing um, everything about last week would not affect you this week. Yeah, no, I, I, I kind of got that far. Okay, so there's yours. So I stopped sharing my video, so if you want to share or anyone wants to share. Oh, sure. 
share screen. That's the one. You cannot share screen while the other participant, or somebody else's. Uh, are you sharing again, Jim? James, still there? Yeah, have I? Oh, sorry, I am sharing. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thought I'd stopped. Yeah. Okay, I shared, it'll show up eventually. All right, so we got a rectangle, we got a surface, we got some control points. One thing that's uh, just on um, some of the files when you download them or have a look at them, um, this CP um, is uh, gonna be the same for control points and closest point. It can be kind of confusing when you um, uh, might look at my files and say, oh, is that one or the other? So you kind of have to manually check, is it control points or closest point? But anyway, um, mesh UV, and then we have an edge lens and a merge and a vertex loads and a vector. And, and. Okay, so um, one of the just extra things it's it's um, is is just the show command, and uh, you can see when you turn it when you do it when you turn it on and off, it just means the surfaces of the mesh, uh, of the mesh are shown uh, as opposed to just the points. So it, it's kind of one that you just need. It's, it's part of the um, uh, Kangaroo plugin. It's that light bulb on the main uh, menu, but you can just type show and it should pull it up. Uh, oh, you're typing in Rhino, not in Grasshopper. Okay. So you just need to make sure you're in Grasshopper. Yeah. So that's show. And that's just for, that's not um, part of the, uh, that's part of a, a sort of this physics part of Grasshopper. It's not part of everything else. But so we need the, just the mesh connected to show and that also merged as data. It's not an essential step, but it's sort of useful. Uh, oh, is that is probably the one that I put the, uh, is that the, oh, yeah, did I, I don't know, I can't look at yours because I'm looking at mine on the other screen. Yeah, but just put that into the merge. It just means, yeah, I'll show you when we get to the end that, um, what that means for, yeah. Uh, okay, so did I, so the control point does go into the anchor and where's, and the anchor goes into another, oh, it goes into the other one. The into the merge, it doesn't matter, I don't. I think it matters what order these are in. Um, but it's just all of these are forces. So we have anchor points in the corner. We have sort of edge lengths, which allows the mesh to stretch by a certain length factor. Um, the vertex loads put sort of forces uh, on the Z, so pushing vertically up or down. Okay. And then that goes into the top, into goal objects. Woohoo! And um, you, it's good to just put a button on the reset, um, which just lets it, it resets it, but you'll see why that's useful later on because it doesn't always um, kind of clear its cache and, and reset. That sometimes you need to manually click the button, say, forget about this stuff that you've previously had and just start afresh. Okay. Yeah, so the button just goes into the reset and you just push the button and it resets it. Um, so yeah, you can see, um, the strength of the pinned anchor points, uh, if that's, that's high enough to, to keep them in those corners, if it wasn't high enough, um, this would basically float. And it's worth sort of seeing what happens when you have that too low. Your geometry just literally floats like a balloon. If it go, go even lower, it just floats like a balloon, just goes off into space. And then you know, um, mm. okay, this, this, this geometry is not anchored. There it is, it just floated and just went into, you know, it's going up into the atmosphere. And that's because it's just not anchored and there's a for there's an upward force on that geometry and that upward force is just gonna keep pushing it up and up and up uh, until it's anchored and you can just reset it. So that's great. And- Perfect, thank you. I will stop sharing that one to let somebody else have a chance. And I will solve, I will save this, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone else um, caught up with us? Or 
uh, pretty good. Uh, I like the wind. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of, I mean, there's so much in this like plugin that it could be a whole course in itself, but um, it's just lots of forces, collision forces and uh, gravity and yeah. things like that. So um, if everyone's caught up, I'll move on, if that's okay. Okay, so my screen is shared. Um, so this is a, a single surface and um, I'm just gonna bake this surface. I could do this in Grasshopper, but I'm just gonna bother. And I'm just gonna copy this um, surface several times in Rhino. So that means I'm uh, right click bake, which pushes it into Rhino. And then in Rhino, I'm typing um, copy, paste, and I'm just selecting um, the corners and making nine of them or, or whatever you want. And then I'm going to right click surface, or actually maybe I'll, I'll just get a, a second one. So I'm going to copy, paste, and I'm going to right click on the, on the second one. And oh. Stop using the, the rectangle. Uh, so I did a control to, to get rid of the, the rectangle to the surface. So now I can set multiple surfaces and set all nine surfaces. So I'm right clicking set surfaces going into Rhino and then I need to press enter. So no. And that's currently turned off, which is why I can't see it, but um, so control Q, there it is. So I have my nine uh, squares, um, right beside each other. And I'm gonna just control shift to drag uh, this inputs from this one to that one. And now I get the same thing that happens, it's kind of figuring itself out as, uh, nine squares and it's sort of still locked to the middle. So now it's kind of like a, a farmer's market that looks kind of cool or something. And if I, um, I'm gonna right click and internalize this data, which means it's sort of saving the surfaces into um, Grasshopper. And I can do show here bring these surfaces back. And now these surfaces are not linked to Grasshopper in any way whatsoever because they're internalized. And I can, um, if you have the function key on and F10 to do the points, this is more Grasshopper stuff, or sorry, more Rhino stuff. But um, if I distort, some of these control points. And I don't want to move any of them so that they separate from each other. So I'm just kind of looking for the some of the edge ones to move them. This is more rhino stuff. I guess it's Is this covered in your earlier um, Rhino course? Yeah, it's it's covered earlier. Um, and that's still available on uh, Hackaday, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, okay. you could just create this geometry in um, Grasshopper if you wanted, um, kind of doing it through numbers. But um, just showing that the idea that if you had different surfaces as an input. So as a third one, I'm going to set multiple surfaces. And now I've got my distorted still all touching on the um, intersecting edges. Right. And this time I'm going to shift my uh, control shift and move it to this geometry. And again, now you can see that is kind of falling there and sort of slightly bigger where the surface is bigger or slightly taller. Very cool. And that's kind of uh, most of what I wanted to show you. Just 
different surfaces and used multiple surfaces. Um, on the file that I uploaded, I did uh, what I showed last week, last week of having a, a stream gate and a drop down menu where I have the three input surfaces and you just from the drop down menu choose whichever one in it. It sort of um, is in last week's video if you haven't seen that. And I got some 20 seconds in before I got confused. Huh? I got about 13 and a half minutes in before I couldn't get the first box, the first component to work, to operate the same last way. week. That was last week. Yeah, I was doing it. Sorry. Well, that's that. But I, yeah, just okay. the idea of we can mess around with surfaces and the input geometry and uh, all of this will, will sort of say the same. And that's kind of my vault example done. Um, I guess the last part is more Rhino than Grasshopper. So um, if you know, you know. The, um, I'll just move on to the, the next example. And um, that's entirely in, in Grasshopper. It's kind of uh, fairly simple or fairly similar in that um, we just want to change around how we think about um, what are the anchor points so I'm going to I'm going to copy paste everything because I'm going to just make some um, changes. Okay. So I want to go back to my single surface. So I'm going to control shift and go back to my single surface and I'm going to delete these ones from my copied section. And I need to control Q turn them off from this top example so they're not on. I'm basically going to make a, a cushion using the sort of same logic. Okay. So one additional thing we're going to want this time is divide surface. And that's just a UV division of points on a surface. So divide the surface. And this is going to be our um, what do you call like the little circles on a cushion that sort of pin it in um, whatever they're called? When you're smocking, like the I don't know, but like when you have a, a sort of cushion, the cloth. yeah, you like pin it. Um, I don't know what they're called. Actually, <laughs> um, you'll see visually when it's there, right? Um, so um, default is ten. I want that to be way less. Okay, so that's that. I want to use, um, so on the intersect uh, tools of Grasshopper, uh, INT, when you're um, got a small window, it says intersect and full when you have it full. And what I want to do is a command that differentiates between these points on the outside and points on the inside. This is a really nice way to do it with meshes but, and, and vertices of meshes. But um, I want to do it with my surface as well. So I'm going to use, um, uh, actually, I think it's here from curve and the analysis that point in curve. And you can just type point in curve. I think it should. Yeah, get it. That one there with the bean shape. And these are our points. That's all of our points outside and inside. And uh, let's write points for the region and curve to test. Okay, the boundary region. So the boundary region is our original rectangle. So I can drag that in there. And that's just testing these points in that rectangle. If points were so if you highlight over this R for relationship, it says that it's going to assign a zero for points outside, a one uh, for when they're on the line, and two if they're inside. And currently, they're sort of in um, these paths of four. So if I flatten the information coming in here, then I get 16 values that are either zero, one, or two. We don't have any zeros because we have no points outside of that boundary. But those ones and twos are are useful, and so now I want to do um, dispatch 
which is going to separate any list uh, by pattern. I could alternatively do code pattern, but um, for code pattern, it just gives me uh, one option. In dispatch, it, it is exactly the same as code pattern, but it gives you the code pattern and then the opposite of the code pattern. Um, so it gives you two groups, A and B. And that's going to separate these points um, one together. But the dispatch is looking for true and false, and uh, which can be represented if you want as zero and one. And currently we have uh, one and sorry, we have one and two. So I just I have this pattern, but it's got ones and twos rather than zero and ones. So I'm just going to type minus one, which automatically gives me this subtraction subtraction command, and it automatically is already set to uh, one on the, the B. So if I do minus one from all those values, I can see that's sort of four ones and then two two, and then this should be four zeros and same pattern. Yeah, so that's all the values of minus one. And that is my pattern of true false um, separating. So if I just check, with a point command that A should be, it's not working currently. Um, wait, uh, inside is two. I need to, oh, that's sort of also in pass. That needs to be fun, probably. That's probably what it was. Yeah, so it was in pass and therefore it needs, so this is the true false values has 16 values. And now that we flatten that, that's 16 points all flattened. Um, this pattern is gonna separate of true false is gonna separate this list into two groups and B is the outside points and a is the inside points. So now we've got the inside points in that. And if I was to increase this grid, that this will always select the points inside without the points outside. OK. So one important thing with this whole um, kangaroo physics thing is the points, if we, if we put points that aren't on this mesh that we're splitting up. So um, if these are the points that are on the mesh, if we have anchor points that aren't on this mesh, they won't anchor at all. They, they just will be invisible. So we need um, these points to be the closest they can to these points that we don't want points that aren't on exactly intersecting with the points that are actually part of the mesh itself. So for that, we need a, a closest point. And that's just saying um, the points to search from and the cloud of points to search. So the cloud of points is going to be um, the mesh points and so the mesh vertices. We can actually probably just use that. I don't know if that won't work. Um, Oh yeah, okay. So because it's got three outputs, it's selecting, selecting multiple things. Um, so these points are the points we're looking for and those points are the points we don't want. So it's kind of easy with four, but if I make it bigger, that that would have uh, now 16 points 
but they need to perfectly intersect with the grid. So these are the 16 closest points that are not exactly those points. They're really close to each other probably, but they're not exactly each other. So we need these points to anchor um, the cushion. And I'll just leave it at, at 16 uh, points. So if I turn on this geometry, So we can pin, um, anchor those points, which will pin them. So I'm just gonna put these points now as my anchor points, removing whatever previously was there. That's currently uh, a little messed up looking, but that's fine. I definitely don't want the strength to be 2000 anymore. Um, in fact, I just might make a, a smaller slider. So it's, it needs some anchoring. Um, actually, sorry, I still need the, the anchoring points. I'm gonna control Z, undo that. Um, let's do a point load, which just is load. It's the um, same thing, I guess. Um, so these are gonna be our point loads and um, we need a, a vector can see force vector and weighting. Okay, I guess I can just do it with the, the vector. Okay, and uh, that's just gonna be another force in my thing. Um, so I guess 10 doesn't actually affect this much. Let's put a hundred slider. And they're all just relative to each other. And um, we can either do a uh, minus a slider or we can just put a negative component in here because I actually want it not to add to the forces. It's meant to be the other way. So currently this is still a little messy. Let's just spread these out a bit. So the second big change we have to do um, for it to be a cushion is, um, is pin all these edges so that we don't get these arches like a vault. And um, well, we could use this um, point loads if you remember that the sort of tent, um, let me turn this down. This should stretch uh, to some strength. Well, let me do the first part. So with these um, points, if I wanna pin, the entire thing down like a cushion. I want every single point on the edge of um, the edge of the surface to be anchored and to be anchored with a, a heavy weight so it's not going anywhere. So that's why I have this uh, naked vertices and I've got the naked points, the ones on the outside and the clothed points, the ones on the inside. So I want all of the outside points to all be anchor points. And that just immediately locks our thing to, um, to be fully sort of stitched on all the edges. And now we still need to get this working. So that's the negative. I think it's somewhat working. It just, we, we need more holes. Oh, that's only got one hole in the middle. And I'm going to turn off lots of geometry so that it doesn't get in the way. Okay. 
Why is this not working on one side? No. Refresh this. Oh, so that, that was a perfect example there of it sort of was only working on one side and not on the other. And um, I just needed to reset it and push the button. So when I make changes here, they don't always um, update entirely. Um, I think I want more um, inflation. Oh, not that much. Okay. So I pushed more inflation. And then the other thing I might want to do is increase the density of our mesh. So I'm going to make this way more dense. Um, so it was 10 on the UV. I'm going to make it 30. And you see there, it's um, all the settings now are kind of a little bit off. So this can go. Us. Okay. All right, so now you can kind of see this cushion shape developing. You were, so you were talking about the buttons that hold it down. The, huh? You were talking about the buttons that hold the the, the yeah buttons. I just couldn't think of that word. <laughs> ah, you needed a reset button for the word button. Got it. Yeah, um, I don't know. Some things just go blank sometimes. And um, just as a quick end to this kind of cushion example, so this is one side of the cushion, and it's very quick to um, just take that geometry and uh, do a mirror. And um, the, this O is the same as this geometry here. That's just sort of copying it. So I can put that into the mirror and it's mirrored over there, which is not what I want. I want to mirror on the XY plane and put that into the plane for mirroring. And that puts it directly underneath. And if I do shift and put that, so they're both the, the regular one and the mirrored one are both going in. But now I've got two on the bottom because this is going to have the surface and this is going to have the surface. So I can turn, turn both of these off. And now I've got one surface on each side. And I've got the, the, the buttons on both sides. And that's my how I changed it from a vault to a cushion. So. Um, if I bake it, it might be. Yeah, you can kind of see it there. Um, I don't think my points are even, but I, I guess there's other ways I could work out how I would create the buttons or what where I'd create the buttons. But um, the important thing is that the point loads or any kind of loads are identical to points on the mesh itself, that is the original mesh points, which are those, well, are, are the points both inside and outside of that. So that's our, our sort of second example is the cushion. And um, we'll do Q&A now and any help to, to get that done. Uh, a sort of a usability question. Um, is there a, a shortcut to um, hide like the control Q for a, a broader selection? It, it inverts it, right? Um, yeah. Is there a way to set that all to hide um, or all um, to show? I'm used to just doing control Q. Um, there is, I think, um, I don't have a, um, a mouse uh, click wheel. Okay. But the click wheel brings up this other menu, and um, it brings up this like little circular menu that might have something on it. Um, so actually, there solution preview selected off. Ah, yes. 
you could probably um, control Q as toggle preview, which is slightly different, but that's probably what you're looking at. It doesn't have a shortcut, but there might be, and it has, it's just basically a, a face with a blindfold. And, um, um, but on that uh, click wheel menu, um, there's a way to bring it up, even if I don't, I can't remember what the shortcut is to increase. Oh, yeah, yeah my face um, used to show the radio menu, you can still get it by mouse button. Control space, wait, uh, control space. Oh, there you go. That's the thing I'm on about. Right. And oh yeah, and there's the face with the mask. I don't know why this. Oh, I just. Uh, sorry, I'm just meant to click it once. Okay. And there's the face with the mask on it. Yeah. And the, there's the opposite. Cool. All right. So that's that. Um, sorry, slightly tangential. No, no. I mean, it's a good question. I'm close. I missed the flatten on the control point, I guess. No, sorry, closest point. I missed the flatten on the closest point. Um, and so my load wasn't working and I, I lost the the adjustments to get the sides down. I think it was yeah. just things. Cool. Um, so it's working now? Or? Yeah, no, I, I flattened it and now the load is working. And oh, that's not where you flattened. You floated on flattened on the disk pad. Not there. Okay, sorry. That. With the, the flattens, I guess it's it, like I'm kind of just looking at it. Um, if you see my screen where I hover over the letter, but I mean, yeah. I think before I was more confident in, in Grasshopper, I would do the um, double forward slash and start looking at information and saying, Okay, that's um, that's what you want. It's not what you want. Yeah. That's in. Yeah, I see it there. It's in the sort of four paths, and um, I need that to be flat because that should be one list that needs to. That's just sixteen zeros and ones, trues and falses in one path. Therefore, it needs to intersect perfectly with something that's also in one path. I couldn't think of the word button. The same if you used um, relatively similar um, grasshoppers um, file. If you were to make one of those tents where you wanted it to um, poke out at one point, kind of like the Munich uh, Olympic Stadium, which would be a mast. Um, but it would be the same logic, just reverse vector to sort of make it point outward. And actually, on my file, one of the reasons the geometry looks a bit messy is because the amount that it's pointing in, if I was to probably look at this in a, in a side view, is pointing all the way through the cushion, which is not realistic. Yeah, so that's why it's messed up. Does anyone um, need any help? Share screen or? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take you up on that. Um, so I was just messing with my settings. So basically I need this cushion to be inflated and the buttons to pin in and them not to pin all the way to pierce the whole thing, but I've kind of got this um, fairly inflated cushion probably overinflated, but okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing.
Um, so I, I just, I'm not sure. I think that's from the first one. I'm not sure what I'm sharing, why I've got it. Uh, sorry. Let me know when you see it. Uh, I yeah. just increased the mesh and just decreased the rectangle edge. Okay, so um, I mean, all these points are um, sort of, they have a force on them and they're being blown up into the air, but I can't really make sense of them. So let's like turn off some of the final steps. So we just get back to the, the beginning steps. Uh, or I'm just gonna squint my eyes and, and read some of the stuff. So you got a rectangle going into a surface. One thing, by the way, my rectangle uh, was 100 by 100, I think, yeah. um, which meant that would all the other settings, if you use the numbers I used, would be kind of a bit off. Because as I said in this, and, and one thing to add, by the way, that this is a, um, a physics engine designed by an architect, not a sort of physics engine designed by engineers. And as a result is a kind of impression of what a vault would be, as opposed to something that can be uh, trusted to work in reality, but it kind of gives um, something close. There's other software that is specifically for engineering that if you were actually to build this, um, the engineers would want to calculate more accurately, but it, um, it kind of gets you at least from a design perspective, uh, most of the way there. Because it's missing a whole bunch of, um, I don't know, real world um, data of, of the tension of material or, or something like that. It's just kind of yeah, numbers there, relative to each other. Is there a way to put in like material properties in, in grass or um, kangaroo? Um, not really in this. Um, so, um, or at least I don't think so, but there's, I mean, it's just kind of this whole kangaroo is just based on numbers relative to other numbers. Um, if you get those numbers somewhat close to reality, you'll be closer to reality, but it's still not an engineering um, ready to build solution. So um, for the second example, we need to get um, the anchor points, which is just a very quick switch, switch the naked points uh, coming out of the mesh, which is that thing that we didn't touch. The point um, that I made on the right of it is just so I could see the points separate from all of the points that were part of the component to, to the left. But um, you can plug directly from the naked points or from the point, it's the same thing, and put that into the anchor points. So now all the points are there. And kind of what I was saying earlier, um, just to repeat it, that if I did a divide curve on the edge of this curve, the divide curve points may not perfectly intersect with these points that we've used. Therefore, they wouldn't actually create anchor points because they don't perfectly intersect with the points on the mesh. So that gives us our, our kind of cushion uh, effect. And then now we just want to work on the top part, which um, is there. Can you just highlight over um, the uh, dispatch to see what's going in each of them? So 16 values uh, as points, that's fine. And then on the other one, okay. So that um, needs to be flattened. So flattened B? Yeah. I can't remember if I flattened it before. Yeah, I can see it working in your Rhino. Uh, just check what it says, just to double check. It, it, that should be zeros and ones or trues and falses. Yeah, okay. So now it's 16 trues and falses as opposed to four falses on one path and four true and falses on the second path and so on. Um, I might have used a flatten somewhere else, um, but it, it's, it doesn't matter. It's the same uh, outcome. And then you just mirror the end. I don't know if you've done that already on the. Oh, I have that part. I actually I got. I'll probably get it wrong, but I did understand. <laughs> yeah, it's super simple. This end part. It's just um, mirror the geometry on the x y plane. Um, so we're using a plane and just basically.
So that's currently default, maybe set to, I can't make out what axis you are, but definitely Z, XZ or, or YZ, depending on what way that is. So we just want to change that to XY plane or X, just put XY. Yeah, there we go. And then that's kind of it. Um, I put both the output of the Banksy solver and the mirror onto a geometry um, component, which just sort of, if I want to turn them on and off, means they're on the same component. So I can turn everything else off. And I just have this final step, which is my on off switch. Um, uh, you need to do the shift to make sure they both go into that geometry. And that's uh, our cushion example. With a bit of physics. So some of the other, I mean, there's quite a lot of YouTube tutorials, or there's some YouTube tutorials on kangaroo, and um, they're all kind of just different principles of, of uh, physics um, that generally all work by creating a bunch of forces and putting them into a solver and, uh, and getting to the end. So, um, I'll go back. Is anyone, is there any other questions or has everyone else? That is a cool cushion, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, get the Ikea effect. Anything you've done yourself, you feel is cooler than it actually is. <laughs> Or the IKEA effect, sorry, it's it's if you do 5% of the work or 1% of the work in making it, you feel so proud of it. Anyway, that's um, yeah, no, right. it's even better than that, but yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna um, so now um, for this for the last part, um, we're gonna um, download a plugin. Um, on the Hackaday page, I put a link in the week five uh, page. But um, you can just search it if you want. Um, it's Anemone is the, the plugin, and it's A-N-E-M-O-N-E. -E. And I'm going to share my screen. And um, All right, so that's how you spell it. And um, basically, you need the .gha file, which should just download, get the latest version, which is still like a couple years old. And um, then if you see my screen, we go File, Special Folders, and Components. And that just opens um, um, a file browser or whatever it's called. Um, Windows Explorer, and um, you just drag in the .gha file from your downloads folder or wherever it downloaded, and just copy paste it in. And then you need to close Rhino and close Grasshopper and uh, relaunch it, and it should be should be there. And uh, I'm not going to do um, a very complicated example um, for doing loops, just going to um, show how it works. So I guess um, if you want to like look at my screen um, and then maybe we can figure out it at the end, because this is not going to be that complicated of an example. But um, so um, these tabs, uh, the plugins load on the right hand of the, or the right side, of the regular um, tabs. So the, the regular tabs are parameters, math, set, vector, curve, surface mesh, intersect, transform, display. And then these are plugins that I've installed. Um, and I want to use Anima, which in my case is the last one. And that just gives me these very small menu that um, in this first uh, drop down menu, 
a class has loop end and loop start. And I want a start and an end to my loop. And I'm just going to turn off anything from the previous example. So it's not in my Rhino window. OK, perfect. OK. So when I set up a loop, I'm going to have some geometry on the left side, which is kind of coming into my loop. Uh, then I'm going to have what's happening in the loop. And it's going to make its way over to the end. And there, OK. So the first thing is we have uh, an n, the number of times to loop. So I'm going to put a 100 point slider there and turn it down to something smaller. And then the t is a trigger, um, which we can just do as a button. And that's going to be a reset button, essentially. And then do uh, is the data that we want to loop. Um, and we put it into the, the middle here. So if I do the simplest example um, of um, a point, or let me type it as zero, uh, comma, zero, comma, comma, so an origin point, and uh, I'm going to move that origin point on the, let's say, on the unit y by 100. And then create a line using the move point and the origin point. Oops. All right. So uh, when I highlight this is green, the y axis is green. So it's kind of a camouflage there, but there is a line there. And I can put my line into the loop start here. Um, the top of the loop start is connect to the loop end. So that just needs to be linked to say this start and this end are paired, the dashed line. The counter is um, on every single loop going to uh, sort of add one. Uh, if we want to use that in our geometry, we can use that in or in our um, file. Uh, I'm not going to use it for the first time. I'm going to just put a double forward slash and a panel, which when I start it will show what uh, number it's on. And then um, let's say uh, very, very simply um, uh, rotate and change the uh, angle to degrees. And we're going to take this uh, geometry and rotate it by, let's say, 10 degrees. Um, and actually, to make a full circle, we'll make the loop run 36 times. So it's 360 degrees total. And uh, Let's just keep it that simple and put that geometry to the end of the loop. And here we go. And if I put the button, it basically runs our loop. And there it goes. And um, that's sort of the step one. So I can turn that off. I want that on. Wow. All right, so it just goes around uh, like a clock. And you can kind of see the panel for the C, um, which is the counter, which goes there. It goes around. And then as just one last uh, step of this example, uh, right click and put record data. And the difference there is um, now it does not um, delete each step of the loop. It sort of saves it as um, the whole geometry and this loop end here is is that geometry, whatever that um, the whole loop is operating. So that's the simplest example I can think of of using a loop. And I guess if we do that, I had 
one other um, uh, really easy example of a loop. Um, but I don't know, does anyone have any questions about this so far? Otherwise, I'll just move on. And even if you guys haven't done it, it's. Um, so I ended up copying anemone into the um, uh, grasshopper components directory and then starting it, but then it didn't appear on the menu. And I think I may have. Did, did you restart it or? Did you restart? Um, I'm not sure I did the first time, but I did that time and it wasn't there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. I've sort of cleaned it a bit. And of course, it decided it wanted to install a new version. Oh, OK. That's all right. No, that's it, it's it's come back. Anyway, I'll I, I'll just sort of quietly scream into my soup in the background, and I'll be right back. I think I've had about the same experience. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that you don't have the plugin installed, or or did you? Work? Yeah, I um I, I threw the plugin in that uh, folder as well. Restarted a couple of times. No dice. Um, I accepted the update recently, which was probably only this week. I saw that, and uh, still hasn't appeared in the the upper right to the right of human near kangaroo and human. Yeah. Um, do you, so you've human installed or you may not <laughs> it, it seems that way. Um, yeah, okay. that's the, my, my rightmost two are kangaroo two and then human. Oh, okay. Um, unless I installed, but it's, it's a dot GHA file that you have. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's 175 kilobytes. Since yeah. Since. It shouldn't be that big. Um, yeah, mine's 175 as well. And um, just to check on the path on Windows that it's in uh, users and basically Grasshopper libraries. It's Grasshopper components. I couldn't find Grasshopper. Oh, no, no, it's not in users. It's in, I put it in a program. I couldn't find it in, oh, so it's in the users. That's my problem. Uh, it's not working from the Grasshopper components under program. Uh, so I'll put it where you just said. <laughs> Yeah, so strangely, um, it's components when you're in Grasshopper, but the name of the folder is actually libraries, which is in your Windows users, whatever your name is, then app data roaming Grasshopper, and then libraries. Well, <laughs> and then once it's in there, Close Rhino and restart. It should. Or maybe just double click it, see what happens. I don't know. Um, I think. Open the folder that contains all the user, oh no, sorry, components folder. Third party component libraries. So you got the, the oh, folder to open correctly. Grasshopper roaming, update on oh. Grasshopper libraries. So, but you got like in Grasshopper file special folders components. Got it. I see what's going on. Did that open the right folder? Uh, yeah, I think it did. It said folder is empty now, which is an improvement. Oh, well. Um, it, no, no, it is. It should be empty because before it, I was in the wrong folder and it was showing that it had stuff that was not helping. Sorry, I'm not explaining this very well. I've had an. I've had something good has happened. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Two steps back. As um. So this is the. Uh, I just loaded up on my screen just to show you because it only takes like two seconds to show you. Um, uh, this is the file that I uploaded. I, I uploaded all the suites, um files already to the Hackaday page. Oh, no. five, and uh, example one is the one we just did. And um, just to explain this one, this is a rectangle of 100, populate 2D, which just puts a bunch of points uh, anywhere in that. If I use a seed, it would randomize them. Then makes a, a Voronoi. Um, um, let me just turn this up. So I have a rectangle and then populate 2D puts a bunch of points there. I have a hundred points currently. I could turn that down and then makes a Voronoi, which is um, 
the sort of cellular structure around the points. And that's just the Voronoi com command. I um, have the rectangle to crop because otherwise this Voronoi sort of spreads out. And, okay. and that's going into the loop start. Um, and basically all I've asked it to do is list item, which is take each cell and um, take the count, which, um, you know, when this loop runs, the first um, one will be zero, then one, then two, and so on, and um, use that count as the extrusion. So every extrusion is going to be slightly bigger than the last one because it's going to multiply by the count. Um, so the C is the count, and it's it's uh, multiplying. Uh, I I think I added one because I didn't want a zero. Yeah, so I just added one to the count, and then so the first number would be one, not zero, and then multiplied by whatever this is, unit Z to extrude vertically, and then count the extrusion. So it's a, a solid um, thing. Then finish the loop, and um, that's it. And one thing is uh, important is. Um, the Voronoi cells, the initial cells that I didn't want to, they, they shouldn't be in the loop. So they actually go all the way to list item, but this file will be downloadable. And just to show you it, it working. Um, so when I click the button, I'm sorry, I need to turn on the B rep at the end. Um, so restart. So each cell and the cells are randomly numbered because they're not sorted um, as a list. and it just um, randomly makes it taller, each one until they're all done. And because the, the, the number here is both the number of points in the populate 2D, which is the number of Voronoi cells, and also the loop count, um, because they're matching the same slider, that means that the two lists are the same length. And that's just the second example I was going to show you, but I guess we're running out of time. But it, it's it's a very simple example for on how to loop. So, um, did you guys get your plugin installed or not? Um, no, I got it in the right place now, but it still didn't. When I restarted Grasshopper, it still didn't show me the menu for. Uh, so it should just appear at the top here. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll debug that separately. I'm 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 happy with that. Well, um, I'm gonna have to run in like ten minutes. But um, I, um, if this doesn't work, I'm happy to like. I mean, one is just check the install instructions to make sure it's in the right place. I'm almost sure that that's where it should be in the components folder, which is reach through file special folders components. Um, that's where mine is. And I don't think I have anything in user objects. Yeah, which is another place that sometimes you do components. Um, possibly some other reason that might not be loading. Yeah. Um, but, um, and then, so the last thing I was going to say as well, um, other than the Q and A around this is um, Hackaday wants to do a certificate for people that prove they finished the course. So um, I created a, um, uh, on, the, on the Hackaday page, a submit final project and just any grasshopper file, I just put furniture or anything that you can think of that shows, you know, some of what we learned in the course is uh, acceptable. So if you just put a downloadable link to your file, wherever it is, and, uh, and that's really it as a little project. Don't spend too long on it so that just submit it sooner than later. And uh, that's the content of the course. So first, thank you very, very much, James. This is, if, well, for your patience, amongst other things, is I, I will go back and do your 3D, your Rhino course, but uh, I really appreciate what you've, uh, you've put together here. It's, it is fascinating. Yeah, thank you. James, thanks yeah. a lot, man. And I actually, and I, I, as I said, I didn't get all the way through last week's lecture, but I got through to the, I think it was the mode lib, um, uh, like I got through about 15 minutes, but they, somewhere in the, the mode lib piece, right where I was at, you actually showed something, it was um, um, attraction points. 
essentially it's almost the same as Tobler's law of geography. And I'm actually going into a, a, a lunch presentation. Hey, here's five seconds of something or other tomorrow. I was wondering if I could have your permission just to show a few few seconds of your video right in around there, the force attraction around the 10 minute mark. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, I guess on YouTube, but yeah, I don't know what permissions are needed, but yeah. Well, I, I figure if I ask you, uh, that's enough, that's a start. If you say, uh, start filling out paperwork, then I won't bother. No, but no, no. If you're okay with it, because it, it's I'm very okay, okay. close to what happens from a GIS perspective, a, um, a geographic information systems, it, it goes the other way where you actually have the layout and you're trying to figure out what the influence of certain things is. So the, the, the distance, uh, the geometry from a point um, influencing the shape was, was kind of cool because it's, it's actually both sides of the same problem. So, um, so I guess just to add on, um... I don't know everyone's background, but um, on GIS, the, the, there's a plugin called Elk. I've never used it, but that is specifically for geography. And um, also the the website I mentioned uh, last week, the generative landscapes. Right. Um, that's a landscape architecture uh, person who um, some of the examples they can get very complex, but the, some of the examples on that website are specific to landscape. Well, that is awesome. Yeah, they're they're complicated, but we're checking out. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, there's, <laughs> this is kind of mind bending, but very, very cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think a lot of people have explored uh, landscape and parametric design, but that, that, that blog is, is one of them. Or maybe that, like, yeah, there's a few master's programs called Landscape Urbanism that produced um, one at Harvard and one at the AA in London um, that kind of do sort of digital geometry and landscape. Neat. So I guess um, I'll be available to answer any questions on the Hackaday page um, for this plugin or any. I mean, these two last examples are pretty, are, are sim more, well, are relatively easy. Um, uh, some of the advanced looping, which might come under recursion or, or recursive design, um, mm -hmm. can get quite complicated. Even the generative landscapes has some quite complicated uh, loop uh, out, um, sort of grasshopper files. But I'll be available to answer that um, if you, Want you can submit the, the final project in the, the link. I, I put it in the link to the, the Google Doc in the comment section in the main page and on the week five. So I put it in three places so it's easy to find on the Hackaday page. And um, yeah, I guess that's it, unless there's any further questions.